Okay, so get this quote, okay? Get this quote. Your heart is thumping, your blood is racing. Fear can make you fast, fear can make you strong. Where's that from? Doctor Who. Doctor Who, yeah, got him. Doctor Who, last night. Mm, did anybody else see Doctor Who last night? Mm. I missed out the clever bit. Okay, let's see if this causes havoc as well. Go on. Fear makes you clever. Fear, make, fear can make you fast. Fear makes you strong. Fear can make you strong. Fear makes you clever. That's interesting, isn't it? Fear. Yeah. Well, Doctor Who last night was all about uh, <coughs> noises at night, something under the bed, stuff that might be there in the dark. Okay? That's what it was on. That's what it was on. And it was on, on fear. And is there anything there to be afraid of? Christians don't need that. They, they have a very real enemy who really is defeated and really is they. You don't need to check under the bed. Our enemy is Christians. We are here for the kingdom of God. Jesus has come proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe the gospel. We've done that. We've started to follow Jesus. And the implication of that is we've got forces ranged against us, defeated forces. Forces that God does not allow to harm us, but forces that challenge us. Now, what's our response to them? What has the Bible got on facing fear because in our experience in our world it'll be there here's where we are in this third section of Mark's gospel <clears throat> there's the first section section A then there's the second section section B funnily enough and the third section yeah you guessed it section C right and here's what's happening in between those markers first of all Jesus sends out the twelve and then you've got the death of John the Baptist for his faithfulness in giving himself to the mission of God and then the twelve return to Jesus and they say you know we've been out we preach we cast out demons and blah 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 all in your name and it's happened it's fantastic and we remind you there's a cost to the discipleship in this world your life is at risk so there's the threat of being part of the kingdom of God from the kingdom of darkness which is defeated and on its way and then in the second section we've got these three encounters either side of a, a central bit about God's word and human tradition and what makes a person clean and unclean. So you've got Gentiles being addressed, uh, Jews being addressed first, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walks on water and heals in Gennesaret. That's encounters with Jews. Then you've got this, this central bit, which it all turns around about God's word and human tradition. And then you've got these encounters with Gentiles that follow. Notice that Jesus feeds the 5,000 at the beginning of his encounters with Jews and feeds the 4,000 at the end of his encounters with Gentiles. What's happening in the feedings? Jesus is there as the Messiah hosting the Messianic banquet as it's expected to come in Judaism in response to Old Testament prophecy. So Jesus is showing himself to be the one who is the host in heaven in modern Christian terms. Now if you missed that last week, it's in last week's sermon. So have a little look at YouTube and see how that all fits together. But that's basically the big picture of what is going on. And there, in the middle of that, having fed the 5,000, Jesus walks on water, the middle encounter with Jewish people. This is a strange miracle of Jesus. It's a rare one. It's not the only one. But it's a rare one in that this miracle is done simply for the 12. It's done simply for disciples. Not for outsiders. It's there to teach followers of Jesus something about their specific situation. And it majors on fear. <clears throat> so, verses 45 and 46. Jesus is giving specific training to his disciples. He's teaching them now through experience. We've had the section, section two. Of, section one was follow me, basically, and, and things that follow from that. Section two was he's called the, the twelve and he's, he's teaching the twelve. Section three of Mark's gospel is learning by doing. He sends them out on mission. And they learn by experience. It's the apprenticeship phase. No longer actors, no, no longer uh, in the audience, now actors on the stage learning as they do. It's training, training, training for followers of Jesus and for leaders all the way. So they've been doing this feeding of the 5,000 and he's shown them, he's given the stuff they'll reflect on later and see that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who's come to bring the end time salvation and will preside over the messianic banquet. He's the one who feeds with manna in the desert, bread from heaven, and so on. But they've been out on mission and they've come back and they're tired. 
They've been preaching the kingdom of God. They've been healing the sick. They've been casting out demons. And they're excited all the way. And they come back to Jesus, who himself has been busy around Capernaum with his ministry. They've been off in the villages. And they come back there and they're tired. And he's been trying for some time to get them away after their tiring mission. He's been trying to get them off into the bushes for a rest. But the crowd see them going away and they run around the top of the lake. And then there's this huge impromptu day conference. And then Jesus turns to them and he says, uh, okay, now you feed these people, it's getting late. And they say, how are we going to find the money for that? It's like eight months wages for anybody just to buy bread. And Jesus says, what have you got? Here's a lesson for you. In doing with what you've got and seeing, with what, God will, seeing what God will do. And he takes five bread rolls and two sardines. The miracle being that the little boy has been so wrapped with the preaching of Jesus, he's still got his packed lunch left. Who'd have believed that? And then he yields it up. Jesus can have it. He can have anything. Right? And he feeds the lot. And by now, they've been through the ringer. They've had their mission. They've had their day-long conference, which is heavy going. And now they've had to feed 5,000 people. And they've seen Jesus do something astonishing that they just can't grasp. Jesus had laid claim to be the Messiah in a highly charged millenarian atmosphere where the coming of the Messiah and the coming of the kingdom of God is, is for many a cry to pick up arms and a call to battle. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. We've done this, you better get out of here. Do you see the point? Get in that boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida and he disperses the crowd and after saying goodbye to them he goes into the mountains to pray because it's really kicking off now it's really coming to a head Jesus lives in an occupied land the invaders are brutal and oppressive violence is being embraced on all sides and Jesus has just fed the 5,000 out of virtually nothing in the desert and they know he's saying I'm the Messiah so immediately Euthos, Jesus puts the twelve in the boat. It says he forced his disciples into the boat. He's having to drive them away. They think the big time's come. They think, oh, here we go. He has to force them into the boat to get away to Bethsaida. He sent the twelve away. They needed that rest. It's been just one challenging thing after another. But the point is they mustn't get enthused with taking their fate upon themselves in the assumption their uprising is going to bring in God's kingdom. It's been a triumph. 5,000 at the conference. That'd be great, wouldn't it? No publicity, no advertising. 5,000 people turned up for church that day. Wow. That conference has been a tour de force. And then 5,000 men are fed with five bread rolls and two sardines long after the shop's shut out in the desert. And Jesus says, go away. Yeah, it's a bit like Monty Python, isn't it? Run away. Yeah? But, but on the basis of huge success. Surely it's all going right. Why are we running away now? Because the kingdom of our God is not the kingdom of this world and doesn't work in any similar way. He brings the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Israel. And he let them go. He sent them away. He dispersed the crowd. Guys, disperse. They've been laid out on the grass. They've been sat around in groups of 50 and 100 like they're getting ready for battle. No, guys. Go home. They were revved up. They were raring to go. Revolution is heavy in the air. And he disperses them, having removed the temptation of such worldly glory from his disciples who might get headstrong. <laughs> they were known for that. The kingdom of God just isn't like that. It comes in weakness and not in power. Not human power, but God's power. And in that time of tremendous success, popularity, opportunity, tiredness, Jesus went alone up a mountain to pray. I just want to mention this is our, our template. He is the one who went up mountains on his own to pray. It characterizes the one we follow. 
We follow a saviour who actually is accustomed to habit, at times of intensity and pressure, at times of popularity and praise, went away from it alone up a mountain to pray. And when he was up there, he looked out over the lake. It's beautiful, you know, we've been able to do this. We've had this privilege once, just once in, in life, just to be able to go and, and get up a mountain and look down on the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. But as he looks down this evening time, it's last light, basically, and he sees the disciples out on the lake. They're doing, they have gone. He has forced them in the boat. He has made them go. And they're in the boat in the middle of the lake, and the wind's coming this way, and they're going that way. And they're rowing into the wind. Now, this is not a storm on the lake. I don't know about you, but storms I'm good with, spiritually, you know. Spiritual storms come along, I can, uh, I can salute, and I can charge up the hill with the best of them, yeah? Rowing into the wind is another story, isn't it? The disciples find themselves in this situation, stretched. Now they're tired, they're worn out, okay? They've, they've, they're really worn down. And now they're trying to get away, and they find themselves, when the evening came, the boat in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land, the evening came. When that, what that means is it was, it was twilight time. Uh, they've, they've had a long day, it was late, before Jesus said, feed him, you know? And it's now gone well into twilight, and he's alone on the land. And he saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And as the night was ending, he came to them walking on the sea. He wanted to pass by them, that's interesting. And when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. They find themselves in deep and alone. Evening came, boat in the middle of the sea, He's alone on the land. We're on our own here. We're on our own in this one. These are the dodgy situations for us, aren't they? These are when fear starts to take off. When you start thinking, I'm on my own with this. I haven't got God here at this moment with me, helping me with this. But we lose that awareness. And it's proper late. And it's twilight. You can no longer see detail, just shapes and shadows. At that time, where you can only just still see that. Jesus saw them toiling at their oars. The wind against them, they're straining. Not a storm, it's a struggle. That's all. And they've been off on mission and they've tried to make off for a rest, but the crowd has pursued them and there was this evening meal thing and the day conference, a lot to take in. And by the time this episode happens, they've been out on that lake in that boat all night long, straining to row into strong winds by the time Jesus starts coming to them easy by now to have had your resources worn down to start thinking everything's against you worn down and Jesus doesn't seem very close by as they strained at the oars Jesus saw them he doesn't just jump straight into their situation he waits a while and then comes the next lesson in their crash course, crash course in discipleship but he's got to leave them with that for a while or they're not going to get this lesson and Mark is writing, under the influence of Peter, we believe, for Christians in Rome who are having to live with that for the time being. There's this difficult situation. You're a slave of a difficult master. You're a legionary. You're a member of Caesar's household. Whatever it happens to be, because we know that Roman Christians are in all those positions. And you're just having to take the strain of that. It's the daily wearing down strain. And Jesus doesn't jump in straight away. He waits a while to teach them the next lesson in Christian discipleship. That they will be strong. That God will have glory. And they're going to learn that lesson through a fit of the screaming habdabs. Jesus saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And they went off with the screaming habdabs. Jesus' answer to all this is to do the impossible. As the night was ending, he came to them walking on the sea. How weird is that? It's weird, isn't it? Get ready for weird, because if you're going to follow a supernatural God, you should expect to see unusual things happen in your time and space. It's going to be weird. Is that okay? I mean, we've got, we've got our own understanding of the world, haven't we? You know, our understanding of the world is generally an understanding of the world where God doesn't just go do weird things outside of the normal rules of physics and time and space. 
but because of who he is, that's what he does. And yet, walking on the sea, we all know that doesn't happen, right? That doesn't happen, does it? Um, I, I wonder if there might be somebody here who heard of this, and I, they're not. <laughs> but there's uh, this conjurer chap, you know, magician on the telly called Dynamo. Well, it's not his real name. And uh, he's pulled these stunts recently, uh, walking on the River Thames, right? Uh, he's got a number of these um, big, big stunts he pulls. A chap called Steve Frayne from Bradford, who goes by the stage name of Dynamo. And uh, he famously did this um, walking on the River Thames. But actually, it appears he was walking on a plexiglass platform in the river because his feet actually got wet. And uh, actually, there, there was an application to the Port of London Authority to build a structure on, on the shoreline. Just to, so it looks like there was a few bits of jiggery pokery going on. Jesus wasn't doing a stunt or a trick. He wasn't using plexiglass platforms, OK? He was out in the middle of the lake where these guys were straining at the oars, walking across the water to them. Not only would it have taken a lot of plexiglass, people would have noticed, and they didn't have plexiglass anyway. So just in case you were wondering, uh, there it is. Jesus came towards their boat in the half light then of the very early morning. And we've got indicators in the passage that that is the point in time that he's coming across. They'd been out there struggling with their oars all through the night. Why did he do this? He did this because he wanted to pass by them. Why did he want to do that? There are some diff different interpretations, at least two common ones. Firstly, it refers to the perspective of the disciples. That is, from their point of view, it seemed that Jesus wanted to pass by them. The problem with that understanding is that's not what it says. It says Jesus wanted to pass by them. Second one, it refers to a theophany and uses the language of the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, when God passed by Moses at Sinai. According to that alternative, Jesus is passing by the disciples during their struggle to assure them of his presence with them. But that's not the teaching point that Jesus enforces here. What is the teaching point that Jesus enforces here? Here's the point of the passage, show you what I mean. It doesn't say Jesus wanted to get into their boat. It doesn't say Jesus wanted to reassure them. It doesn't make the point Jesus teaches anything like, don't worry when you're struggling, because I'll put a, put a stop to that and make life easy for you. It doesn't say that. It, it certainly doesn't make... Uh, the take home from this training session, Jesus always jumps in to make life less scary for you. Actually, Jesus has jumped in to make life more scary for them. Do you see the point? So why is he doing this? It's because he wants them to be afraid. How about that? I'm suggesting, this isn't in any of the books, try this. I'm saying he wants them to be afraid. I want to suggest Jesus has this teaching point that he wants to pass by them in the half light of early morning and he relates that experience closely to what he needs to teach them next in their discipleship, next in their walk with him. And it's certainly something the Roman Christians who are reading Mark need to hear. The New English translation has, as the night was ending, it actually says about the fourth watch of the night. It's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. What do you like at about four in the morning? I'm not on my best. <laughs> it's not my best time of day. <laughs> yeah, Chris is there with his tongue hanging out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not your best time of day. He's passing by them when they're at their lowest and they're worn out from all they've been doing and they're on their own in the middle of the sea and it's going hard because they're straining at the oars and the wind's against them. Is that the week you've had? It's the week I've had. Yeah, it's great. Jesus started his ministry by teaching these people that the kingdom of God is at hand and asking for people to turn to him and to trust him. Yeah? If Jesus is king and he reigns, then fear is a ridiculous emotion for his followers, but it's a natural one and the disciples are exploring that in this experience with Jesus. And when they see this shadowy figure approaching in the half-light before dawn, they don't think, and this is the problem, there's dodgy thinking going on, they don't think that's the Lord of all creation. They're just thinking in their old patterns of thought what their dodgy thinking has been before. Well, it's a ghost. Right. They're thinking their reactions are as yet unreconstructed. And the process of turning from sin and trusting in Jesus is a process of reconstructing the way you view the world. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. And we've repented and believed the gospel. Let's believe it. 
They thought he was a ghost. Explanation of observable phenomena limited to common human assumptions. They're thinking the way they've always thought, not the new way. And they cried out, fit of the screaming habdabs, they cried out, but not in prayer. Ah, it's a ghost! They cried out. Uh, the word means to raise a cry from the depth of the throat, to cry out. Anacrazo, right? It's a good word, isn't it? Feels like it ought to mean something strong like that. From the depth that they cry out. Why? Because they all saw him and they were terrified, deeply troubled, shaken. Now here comes the reason it's in the Bible. He spoke to them. Verses 45 to 46, duck out. Let's go away, get some peace. Verses 47 to 50a, first half of verse 50, freak out. There's a ghost coming. Wah! Verse 50b to 52, chill out. Immediately he spoke to them, have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. What is Jesus teaching in that passage? Here is the central issue. Here is exactly what Jesus is putting his finger on on the page. Listen, have courage, it is I, we'll come to that in a minute, do not be afraid. What's this passage all about? It's all about disciples, it's just for them, and it's about fear. It's about the fear that comes upon us as we live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, in a world that's still so much given over to the kingdom of darkness, with our thinking only partially reconstructed yet. Is that okay? It's one sentence, three, four, three clauses, but uh, I think that's about it. Should we stop? No, we don't. No, just for a minute. We're close to it. What God's people, and here's his point. I mean, he's come to them and he's spoken to them. In that situation, what the disciples all need is to hear the voice of the master, right? That's the situation for all of us. When it's just been too much and it's been straining, it, what we need is to hear the voice of the master. He comes to them and he speaks to them and he changes the entire situation. In these situations, that's always the case. The struggle has now turned into a storm, it's a ghost, and immediately, no hesitation at this point, immediately then he speaks to them. And here's his point. What God's people need to meet the challenges of living as citizens of the kingdom of God in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, what God's people need is the courage born of faith. The courage that's born of faith. Jesus has taken them to the front edge of fear, wah, it's a ghost, to show them they don't need to be bothering with fear. Have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. The really important point I need to make here, and it really is one we must take on board. We live in a historically quite anomalous situation where as the result of post-enlightenment rationalism, the way thought has been ruling British thought since at, last, at least at the middle of the 18th century. UK evangelicalism thinks that doubt is the opposite of faith, right? Now we've got to really push this one because it is a prevailing problem. We tend to think that doubt is the opposite of faith and that works so long as human personality amounts to human beings being merely brains on sticks. And as, as long as our life amounts merely to thoughts, but it doesn't. There's a lot more to human personality biblically than that. This is important. Our brains are vital to our personalities, but that isn't the whole story at all. That isn't the whole of our personality. We live at far more than an intellectual level. We do that as far more than walking intellects. Is that fair? See, if we were just brains on sticks, then maybe the opposite of faith could be doubt. But actually, the opposite of faith, because we're more than that, is the fear that comes from doubt. There's more to it in our personality. Does that make sense? Shall I draw a diagram? I'd love to draw a diagram now. I'd love a flipboard and a big marker. Yeah? We tend to think of humanity as, it's, as if it's just an intellect. And in intellectual terms, possibly, the opposite of faith is doubt. But in human terms, given the whole, uh, all the aspects of our personality, the opposite of faith is going to be fear, and that arises out of intellectual doubt. Our brains are vital to our personalities, but that's not all there is. 
Faith is not merely thinking, but trusting on the basis of what we think and how we think. So the opposite of fear is faith. The opposite of fear is faith. And the pastoral implications of perceiving that, either correctly or incorrectly, are immense. Now, if we're going to be engaged in carrying forward the mission of the Lord Jesus in a fallen world where Satan still fights his tiresome, foolish rearguard action against that defeat he's already encountered at the cross, in such a world as that, if we're to serve Christ as his followers, then the biggest weapon left in the enemy's hand is fear. Because he can't do much but he can make us fear that he can and divert us on that basis. Does that make sense? How important is this lesson for those disciples on that day? It's crucially important to be able to know what to do with their fear because that's all the enemy's got left against us. Is that making sense? He causes an irrational fear, the sort of fear of what's underneath the bed because actually there's no reality or substance to his threat. Facing fear is where faith faces the foe. And that, that applies to all sorts of patterns of temptation, whatever it is that's coming against us. We fear we're not going to be fulfilled or successful or whatever if we play it God's way. We're not trusting him to make it okay if we do play it his way. And in this training session, Jesus is teaching this to his worn-out disciples. They're worn out with it. They've had enough of it. It's gone on for too long. Immediately he spoke to them, have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Have courage. That's the first thing. Faith breeds courage. Second thing, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, I like this New English translation of the Bible. I think it's brilliant. But like every other English translation, it makes a fist of this one, as far as I'm concerned. What Jesus says, the Greek there, very clear, plain now, put it on the board view, echo Amy, Jesus says, I am. Do not be afraid, I am. It is the covenant name for God in the Old Testament. When God appears to Moses in the burning bush on Mount Sinai, what does he say? Who are you? I am. You can read it there in Exodus 3.14. Have courage. Why? I am. I am who I am. Jesus is saying, I am the covenant-keeping God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Moses who appeared to him in the bush on Mount Sinai. That's me. Have courage, it's me. I am is here. Because he is I am, do not fear. And Mark is writing these words, do not fear, to Christians in Nero's Rome. God does love you. He does have a wonderful plan for your life. It may involve lions. And that plan will come under fire from the enemy of souls. You will at least find yourself roaring against the wind and scared stiff in the dark. But the covenant keeping God is your saviour. See the things we believe have implications. If if he is I am, then fear is foolish. More than foolish. It's the opposite of faith. But these disciples can't see that at the moment because they're worn out and they're shattered and they're in the boat and they're rowing against the wind and he's over there and they don't know where he is and they're on their own. He got into the boat with them. Immediately he spoke to them, have courage, Zai, do not be afraid. And then he went up with them into the boat and the wind ceased. Go into the boat with them. And for a believer in Nero's Rome, the ending of the isolation of these disciples in their tired struggle, surely that's going to inspire faith and hope and confidence. And as he did that, the wind ceased. Their long, hard struggle. 
Yeah, well, this is what we believe about he who is I am. He's the Lord of creation. He's the king over the kingdom. And the wearing wind comes to heal when he requires it. It's played a big part in this current disciple training exercise. And God appears, the covenant God of the Old Testament. And the source of their hard slog dies straight down. And, of course, the disciples gathered round and they held an immediate praise party. No. They were completely astonished because they did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. They're just dumbstruck. They're thrown out of position, they're displaced, they're amazed, they're astonished, they're thrown into wonderment, they are dumbstruck, shaken and confused. Why? Two reasons are given, the second explaining the first. Firstly, they didn't get the thing about the five bread rolls and the two sardines, they didn't get it. They didn't get that stuff about the messianic banquet and Jesus Messiah host for the party in heaven. It was about Jesus being the King Messiah, the president of the long prophesied heavenly messianic banquet, the one who feeds his people with bread from heaven in the desert, the saviour of the faithful remnant of God's people. They didn't get it. How can they possibly not get it about Jesus? Not understand who he was, nor banish fear with trust because they'd identified him. How could they possibly be in that situation? Well, that's the second bit of the explanation because their hearts were, hard hearts were hardened. <coughs> their hearts were hardened. And they've seen stuff like that with their own eyes. And they've done miracles themselves. And your heart can still be hardened until the Spirit of God opens your eyes and you see it all in the light of who the Jesus you've trusted actually is. And that's the bit they haven't done yet. It's the identity of Jesus and more and more now up into chapter 8 verse 31 it's going to be about who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Who does these things? No doubt the dopamine rush we get from the immediate challenge and, and fear and stuff is it gets your blood racing, doesn't it? Yeah. It gets your blood racing. And I, I gotta admit I love it. As long as it's under control, you know. <laughs> I love all that stuff. Some beast goes AWOL in the mart, I just you know, I just wanna get in. I just wanna get all of it and ah, what is it? Crazy nonsense. I admit, I love it. But straining at the oars and rowing into the wind, oh, that's different. That has a grinding, that has a debilitating effect on me. And it gets harder and harder to trust him then. So you can't live on fear all that long. And the dopamine gives way to what, what is it, cortisol, the stress hormone? Is that the one? And the effects on your health can become serious. It takes daily sermons to yourself about the Saviour, doesn't it? I am is here. It requires the daily discipline to not be afraid, but to trust I am. It takes feasting your faith on the faithfulness of God, the covenant-keeping God from Old Testament days until now. It takes that massive movement from living on me first to living on I am, who is here. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of darkness will lash back. It's been lashing back at us this week, hasn't it? And the disciples need to learn what to do with this fear. Feeding faith in the God who stands by his promise is the contrary of failing through fear. And the Christians at Rome needed to hear this. And the disciples needed to learn this. And so I suspect to most of us here, Be of good courage. I am. Do not be afraid.